Thanks, Brian. So my uh, mission tonight is to give you a sort of an overview of all the ways you can do interactive graphics in R. Uh, and I think it's worthwhile thinking about like why are, why are interactive graphics valuable and important. Now I'm going to show you probably a few interactive graphics systems that you haven't seen before and maybe a few that you have, but I think it's useful to think about like why. Why, why should you care about interactive graphics? What do they allow you to do that static graphics do not? And I think there really are three main tools. So the first two are pretty obvious and pretty basic, but panning and zooming, right? This is Google Maps. You want to be able to scroll around a plot. You want to be able to zoom in on the areas of interest. And then you also want to be able to say, hey, what's this point? What, who is this person? What is this city? What does this unusual point actually represent in my data? Now I think the most important tool of interactive graphics is linked brushing. So as soon as you have more than one graphic visible at a time, you want some way to connect the observations in those two plots. And what's really neat about linked brushing, which I'll show you a few examples of shortly, is it sort of allows you to get past the 2D barrier. It's very easy to do lots of 2D plots, but how do you discover 3D and 4D insights into, in your data? And linked brushing is a really nice way of achieving that because you can have two 2D views linked together, which in some way will help you understand the data, structure of data in four dimensions. Now there's lots and lots and lots and lots of other specialized tools. I'll show you a few. Um, but I think these are the three main uh, tools. And I think when you're looking at interactive graphic systems, it's worthwhile to think about, well, which of these does it uh, enable or facilitate? So I'm going to talk uh, about three uh, basic families of interactive graphics in R. I've kind of given them all slightly perjurative names. So the first one I'm going to talk about is speaking in tongues. So basically you can write an interactive graphics system in another language, in C++, in Java, in TickleTK, whatever you want, and then you can connect R to it. So this is great because you can write very high performance code in another language. You might use the GPU so you can do really fast graphics. That's really great, uh, but often that means it's going to be hard to install. Uh, they tend to require that these, 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 I think I'm going to show you four, tend to require a lot of investment. They're very deep. So if you invest a couple of weeks really learning how they work, it'll pay off. But they need a big upfront investment before you can use them fluidly. Another system um, hacks R's existing graphics system. So these are tools like Animant, and we'll show you an example of Shiny and GGplot2, Plotly. So the great thing about these tools is you can use your existing code. So often you can only make, you, can, you only need to make very small changes to your code and make your, take your static graphics and make them interactive. Of course, the downside of that is, well, you're going to be limited by the existing tools. They can't, it's very difficult to do things that our graphics were fundamentally not designed to do. And then finally, I'll talk about sort of the, I think the most exciting and certainly where the most development activity is happening today, and that is tools that connect R to the browser. So these are really great because they sort of give you a way of publishing interactive graphics because anyone who has a web browser, which is pretty much anyone these days, can view those graphics. Um, but the challenge is now you've got kind of two programming languages involved. You've got possibly two places where computation is happening. It might be happening in R in your, in your server or it might be happening in uh, the browser on the computer and the user's computer. So we'll talk about all of these three things and show you some examples as we go. So I'm going to talk about four basic systems for interactive graphics that involve connecting R to another graphic system. So the first one I'm going to talk about is called RGGOBI. Uh, this is something I worked on a little bit uh, during my PhD, but this has a very, very old lineage. So I started work on this in about 1991, uh, connecting S the precursor to R, and XGOBI, the precursor to GGOBI. Uh, I think sort of during my PhD, Michael and I uh, brought it back to life with uh, RGGOBI 2.0, which was actually 
feasible for someone to install on their own computers. I'm not going to like lie to you and say it's easy, but it is actually possible to install this uh, for yourself. <laughs> And that, unfortunately, is sort of the story of all of these tools. Uh, iPlots, which was uh, written by Simon Urbanek, uh, had a couple of iterations. Incredibly, incredibly fast. Uses lots of uh, low-level OpenGL stuff to talk directly to the GPU. Incredibly, incredibly fast. And also, unfortunately, incredibly difficult to get working on uh, your computer. Again, it's sort of not so hard these days and as sort of one of the things that I did for this presentation, which still surprises me a little bit, is I have all of these packages working on my uh, laptop today. Uh, sort of the spiritual successor to RG Gobi was Cranvis. Cranvis uh, was built to try and overcome this problem where you have a system that's written as sort of a hybrid of R and C++. And that's really challenging when you have a system like that because now if you want people to add new features to that tool, they have to be both be good R programmers and good C++ programmers. So Cranvis used this sort of layered architecture. It has a series of packages. The Qt package talks to Qt, which is a, um, an open source general purpose sort of window toolkit. Um, then Qt base uses the Qt, no sorry, Qt is the C++ library, Qt, pay, Qt base uses R and C++ to talk to that, and then on top of that Qt paint uh, just uses pure R code, and then on top of that Cranvis is written on top of that. So Cranvis is pure R code built on this sort of hierarchy of uh, abstractions. And then finally I'm going to talk about a very, very a uh, recent package called Loon, uh, which comes from sort of another uh, lineage of interactive graphics called Loon. So let's start with RGGobi. So RGGobi talks to GGobi. How many of you have heard of GGobi before? How many of you actually used it? Okay, cool. So I'm going to show you a little demo of RGGobi. One of the things that is really cool about RGGobi and GGobi is that it implements this idea called the tour. So the, the idea of a tour is a, 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 a dynamic and interactive technique for visualizing high dimensional data sets. And I'm going to show you a little example of that. So I'm going to load in this uh, mystery.csv, very mysterious data set, and open it up. And I'm just going to do a uh, scatter plot matrix to get started. How would you describe this data set? So this is a scatter plot matrix, so showing you all the, the, the looking at the, the three dimensional data set and we're looking at it from all three sides. It just looks like a big blob, right? Is anyone going to disagree with my characterization? <laughs> so what I'm going to do, instead of looking at the, just from the sides, is I'm going to do a tour. And the intuition behind the tour is really simple. You know, if you have an object in three dimensions, you want to get an idea of what it looks like while you rotate it around and look at it from different angles. And what's cool about the math behind that is it's exactly the same as where if your data is in three dimensions or six dimensions. It's basically just some matrix multiplication. So what I'm going to do is start this tour running, and I'm just going to randomly rotate around this 3D data set. And if you watch this for a while, you might see that there's some pattern in here. So sometimes I get lucky when these talks and it just randomly uh, gets there straight away, and sometimes I can tweak it. So this is, I really like this data set because there's incredibly, incredibly strong structure in this data set. But if you just look at it from the axis parallel projections, if you just look at it from the, 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 the sort of architect's plan view, you don't see any of that structure. Now obviously, you know, this, this data did not arise in the natural course of my data analysis. <laughs> and I did deliberately create this, but, you know, sometimes I kind of think, well, you, know, you, look, at a, you look at a scatter plot matrix, and you see this, you often don't think, well, do I need to dig further? You just say, no, that's just random noise and throw it away. But maybe there's something uh, hiding in your data set. 
So ggplot2 does, uh, sorry, uh, ggobi does lots of other things, um, but I'm going to show you, focus on the, the, the grand tour, because this is sort of the one thing that uh, ggobi does that few other packages do. Now the cool thing about this is we can interact with this uh, from R. We could say, well, what is the projection that gives us that striking view? Well, we can run some R code and we get that matrix. We get the projection matrix that if we multiply our data by this matrix, we get that 2D projection, which really shows us that striking pattern. Now the tour stuff did actually, um, it did turn that into an R package called tour. And I just want to show you the tour package is cool because it sort of takes that idea and generalizes it, uh, generalizes it to somewhat uh, slightly ridiculous uh, extents, but let's see if I can. I want to need to do uh, quotes. So you're not limited to just projecting ND data down into two dimensions. You can project it down into any number of dimensions and then you can visualize those dimensions however you like. So this is a uh, Chernoff face, a rightly maligned uh, visualization which maps <laughs> variables to different attributes of the face like the, sort of the, the height and the width and the length of the nose and stuff. And here we're just seeing sort of a random animation and. Uh, I guess I should show you the other cool one. Uh, <laughs> did anyone... Let's see if I can do this. And I have this problem that I haven't used this package for a long time, so I forget what all the functions are called. Here we go. So I should have uh, mentioned that this would be a great time to bring your 3D glasses. So here, the same idea, we're taking a high dimensional data set, we're projecting it down into three dimensions, and then we're displaying those three dimensions with, uh, in a way that you could uh, view if you had 3D glasses, or because actually pretty much like 95% of 3D vision is just a whole lot of heuristics that our brain uses, we can use another Oops, we can use a visualization that just uses all of those heuristics. So here we're just projecting, and this is just pure two-dimensional, but we're using some depth cues. We're using like the size of the points. We're making points that are further away look dimmer. And they're also using the fact that points in front obscure things behind. So this is basically the only time you ever show off 3D graphics because in my opinion, they're just not that useful for data because so much of our perception of depth, perception of three dimensions, is just a whole lot of heuristics, tricks that our brains apply. And those tricks just don't apply when you get very far away from things from physical reality. So that was RGGOBI in the tour package. So the next package I want to show you is iPlots uh, by Simon Urbanek. This is sort of amazing, uh, really, because it's incredibly far. So here I'm going to display a million points. I'm going to display a scatter plot and a histogram. And I can easily do things like make the points smaller and more transparent. I can select points in here. So this is an example of linked brushing. So I select points here and I see the corresponding points in this plot. Or I do the opposite, I click a bar on this histogram. Well, I think, well, that histogram's actually a bit, uh, the bin widths are a bit big, so I'll uh, make them a little smaller. And so I can very, very fluently link between these two plots. Obviously, you can have more than two plots on the screen. And this can be a really, really powerful tool for asking and answering fundamentally multidimensional questions of your data. And this is with a million points, and you can see it's basically, you know, it's instantaneous. It's incredibly fast. So there's a, and then, of course, what you can do, same, just as with RGGOBI, you can interact 
with the plots from R, you can say, well, how many uh, this selected is going to return a logical vector, true if the point has been selected, false otherwise. How many of you know this really neat trick, taking the mean of a logical vector? Mean of a logical vector, the mean is just the sum divided by the length. The sum of a logical vector converts trues to ones, false to, to zeros. So the sum of a logical vector is the number of trues. The mean of a logical vector is the proportion of trues. Really, really handy technique uh, in R. So it's pretty uh, fully featured. Um, you can sort of do arbitrary drawings with R code. Uh, I have a slight, I think this is a slightly nicer example. You know, here I've taken a histogram and overlaid it with a density plot. Uh, so you can do, so iPlots is quite rich. Uh, the problem, however, is that uh, it's not terribly well documented. So as you see, I'm trying to get help on these functions. Uh, they simply don't exist. Oops. So if you're Simon Urbanek or you closely read the source code, you can do a lot with this package, but uh, unfortunately, it's a little hard to use otherwise. The other thing with both um, RGGOBI and iPlots, these both come from sort of specific like lineages of graphical tools sort of coming out of research groups. Uh, and there's a lot going on that like I use these enough that I've sort of internalized the keyboard shortcuts. So for example, like in GGOBI, if you want to get a tour, you press G. If you want to pause the tour, you press W. And if you want to use these tools fluidly, you have to be able to quickly control them using the keyboard. And, you know, W is not the most logical shortcut for pause, for example. So <laughs> many of these tools you almost have to learn via apprenticeship. You need an expert to show you how to, how to work them and then how to use them to achieve specific goals. You'll also notice I'm restarting my R session between each of these examples because if you try and uh, use them all simultaneously, bad things happen. <laughs> so Cranvas, uh, Cranvas was really motivated by the drawback of GGOBI, which was that it was really hard to install. You had to install like a separate package. It was painful for us to build the binaries on the Mac and the win Windows and Linux. And so the goal of Canvas, uh, Cranvas was basically just to let the, all the R infrastructure take care of that. If you can put everything into an R package, then we have this great way of distributing packages to everyone. Everyone knows, well, everyone being like no one, right? But everyone knows how to install an R package. That's really, really easy to do. So the goal was to kind of make this layer of abstraction. So if you wanted to work on Qt base, you needed to be a really good C++ programmer. If you needed to work on Qt paint, you could you know, get by as long as you knew a little C++. And then if you want to work on Cranvas, you don't need to know any C++. You're just using the R functions exposed by the lower levels. This is also built around the idea of a mutable data frame. So in R, whenever you, mod whenever you think you're modifying an object, you're not actually modifying it. You're creating a modified copy. And you can imagine now if you're trying to maintain the state of a data frame in multiple places, and every time you, know, you have a column in there that represents whether the point's selected or not, and every time you modify that column, it just creates a new copy of the data frame, you can imagine that's going to make it very hard to synchronize different views. So Cranvas also had this idea of a data frame that was very much, uh, very much like data tables are today that uses this reference semantic. So when you modify it, it modifies one object. It doesn't make a copy. I think I have a very simple example of Cranvas. Um, oh yeah, just showing off uh, one of the things. So here, I'm going to make this, I take a regular data frame and I'm going to wrap it in QData, which I honestly have no recollection of why, what that's supposed to stand for. But it creates a muta frame from data with attributes. And if we look at this, oops, which I, this is pre dplyr days, so let's just look at the head of that. So you can see this is a data frame that has some special attributes that uh, 
describe how the points are going to be displayed. So I think I also associate it with a data frame as a brush. And so now if we create a scatter plot and a histogram. So not only are these two plots linked together, but now that brushed column in that data frame is also being updated. So again, I can say, well, what proportion is selected? I can select a smaller proportion. I can say, give me all of the data frames. Give me all the rows that are brushed. Not like that, I can't clearly. And so on. So the, the, the goal was to give this sort of seamless, you can work on the graphics from R, you create them with R code, you can interact with them, you can interact with them with visually and sort of tactilely with your mouse, and then you can also work, at them, work with them from the R console at the same time. Trying to integrate the best of both worlds, the reproducibility of code and this really fluid, fluent interaction that you can do with direct manipulation. Just one last one to mention this category, uh, Loon by Adrian Waddell. It's very, very uh, recently available and uh, Adrian has not publicly released it yet and so it's still kind of a secret and you can't show you the code but I can show you what it looks like. Again, one of the things that's cool about Loon so Loon is sort of again provides this full system so I can brush points and do other stuff. One of the things, again I can control it from R, I can change the points to be labels or the sort of thing that I think Loon, oops that didn't work. Oops, look at this. One of the things that Loon is particularly good at is these sort of glyph plots. So it's a little easier to see what's going on if I take these glyphs and I make them parallel. And uh, what is it? There's something in here. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. You really cannot see any difference there at all. But on uh, my screen, you see that gives it a nice uh, pale gray background, which of course I like. But you can see so each of these points is represented by a little line. This kind of looks like a time series but what this actually is is a uh, plot and I think maybe you can see this. So each of these lines represents a variable and <laughs> shows the value for this point on all of those variables. So you can kind of take that idea and instead of putting it in Cartesian coordinates, you can put it in polar coordinates and get these glyphs. So these glyphs are a way of representing multi-dimensional data. So the hope sort of is that, well, so there's these, this data is data about olive oils. The color of the points is the region they come from. The data shown in the glyphs is the composition of the different fatty acids. And maybe what you can see is that it tends to be points with the same shapes, or points with the same colors, tends to have similar shapes, which is kind of what you'd expect if there's some relationship between the composition and of the olive oil and where it's grown. And then again, this supports all of the other things that the other packages I showed you, histograms and lots of other plot types, and then that interaction between R and the, and the interactive graphics tool. So, Loon kind of gets around this compilation problem by using tickle TK, um, which is a well, I think it's been around. It's a programming language. It's been around for a really long time. It has some interesting features as a programming language, let me say that. Um, but it's basically bundled into R. So there's no installation problems. It's just a regular R package. 
Um, I think this, the, the, the challenge of systems like Loon is that it's a, a big investment, but you get a big payoff from it. This is not something you can just say, well, I'm going to sit down and start doing some plots. I'm going to integrate it into my existing workflow. I think you have to sort of sit down and learn this as a tool. It's embedded inside R, but it's actually a completely separate system in its own right. But really, uh, really fantastic work. So those were the speaking in tongues tools. The next ones I want to talk about are the hacks, which I don't mean in a completely perjurative sense, like a hack is in the sense of being a pragmatic solution to a complex problem. And indeed, one of the hacks I'm going to talk about is uh, the hack that uh, Winston did. So, and, and Winston, in fact, is going to talk about it. So do you want to talk about it in this session, or do you want to talk about it? Well, it depends on what you're going to show me. Okay. So I'm going to talk about kind of two main tools, Animant and then ggplot2 and Shiny. They both take a very similar approach. The, the idea is to kind of take an existing ggplot2 graphic and do the minimal amount of changes to make that interactive. There are lots of other ones along these lines. I'm not going to talk about them all here, but some of them are mentioned in the slides and uh, the slides are on my GitHub as well. So Animant tutorial. So Animant... Uh, I don't think this one does anything. So Animant, basically, you take a regular ggplot2 graphic and then you add kind of a couple of special aesthetics. Like we have this click selects and this show selected. And then that allows you to make linked graphics where you can click and... I guess I should have uh, connected to the Wi-Fi earlier. See how long this takes? Uh, but it allows you to click and then uh, make an interactive graphic. Okay. Let's try again. Okay. It allows you to click and you can see the plot updates. So you can see if you're familiar with ggplot2 already, you just need to learn a little bit more and you can create a certain set of uh, interactive graphics. So there's some more complicated examples, uh, but there's quite a lot of flexibility here. So here there's a bar chart and then you select a year on the, sorry, a histogram. You select a year on the histogram and see the map updated. A similar, tool is uh, this uh, interactive stuff built into the latest version of Shiny. So I'm not going to talk much about this. I'm just going to show it to you. But basically this is just your regular uh, ggplot2 plot. And there's been a little bit of Shiny code. So you can now select the points and say, I don't want those points to be fit in the model. So maybe you want to pick these out. So you might say, well, these outliers, these, these guys might be outliers. I want to see what happens when I remove them, what happens to the model. Now, this is obviously really great for when you're trying to manipulate your data so you're, the model you want fits. Uh, but I think it's more legitimately useful like when you're teaching modeling and you want to help people gain an intuition of what happens what, what, is like, what does leverage actually mean? Uh, that's what, how does the model change when you remove one or more points? And again, because this is built in Shiny, we can sort of say, I'm done with this now, and we can return the results from that app in a vector. So we could use this as part of a bigger pipeline. We're not, just, we're not just trapped in the browser. We can get the data back from the browser into R and integrate that into the rest of our workflow. So Winston's going to talk more about that a little later. But this definitely I would like characterize this fundamentally as a hack 
kind of in the best sense of the world. I, I personally did not think this was going to be possible. Uh, and it only took Winston like three days to do it, plus like another two weeks of figuring out the details. But it's neat because it allows you to take, it's like one small step. You have a plot now, and now you can easily add some interactive features to it in your Shiny app. I wanted to finish off by talking about what I think is the most sort of interesting and certainly the most active area of development, and that is tools that communicate between R and the browser. And most of these are based on the HTML widgets framework. How many of you have heard of HTML widgets before? There are lots of you. So HTML widgets itself is actually, you know, so there's an HTML widgets package which is really basically the most incredibly boring package ever. HTML widgets itself doesn't do anything. It's just a set of conventions for describing if you have a, uh, something you want to display in the browser, what are the JavaScript and the CSS and all, what are all the dependencies? What does that need to actually run in the browser? And HTML widgets aggregates those in a way and then just makes it work whether you're in a Shiny app, an R Markdown document, inside R Studio and some other scenario. So I'm going to show you a couple of um, HTML widgets. The first one is 3GS. JS, 3JS, which allows you to generate uh, three-dimensional graphics in the web browser using 3GL, which in my opinion, and I'm pretty sure Brian would agree with me, would agree with me, these tend to be like really pretty but uh, not terribly useful. This is perhaps the most useful one, so a globe and on top of the globe, we have drawn, and you really cannot see this very well on that projector. So maybe you can kind of see that's, that's South America, that's the US. Can you see that if you look at it from the right angle? And so at each location, there's a bar, there's a line, a spoke radiating out. And the height of that spoke is mapped to some variable, and the color is also mapped to some variable. Now, I don't think this is a terribly uh, effective way of visualizing data because it's very difficult to compare these heights because, you know, when you're looking at a, a bar dead on, it looks very, very short. And when you look at it from the side, it looks much longer and every, everything in between. Um, but this is a sort of a cool tool if you just want to wow someone like, hey, I can do crazy. 3D graphics. <laughs> that is not an endorsement that you should go out and do crazy 3D graphics. Another one, a little more on the uh, practical side, is Leaflet. Uh, Leaflet allows you to, to use this uh, JavaScript package called Leaflet uh, to very easily make uh, maps in R. So you can see well, I can't see that very easily. Oops, now I'm zooming the map in. So you can see we have, so we load the leaflet package, we create a leaflet object, we add some tiles. The tiles, are, that's just the name for the background, like what you see in Google Maps or whatever. And then we add a marker uh, on the University of Auckland, which now probably I should be able to navigate my way there, yeah. <laughs> given that. Oops, I've really gone off track. Here we go. <laughs> and so you can see I've, we've put a marker at that latitude and longitude, which it's not, it was not actually created in this park here. <laughs> <laughs> it may, may have been created there. That's the university bar. <laughs> So a leaflet, uh, let's see if, oops, let's. So the goal of leaflet is basically to allow anything you can do with leaflet, the JavaScript package, you can do an R without having to learn JavaScript. So if you've got uh, spatial data, this is a really nice way of displaying it. And let's see if this actually, I can run an example really quickly.
And so you see when I run this in the console in our studio, it displays in the viewer pane and I have this interactive HTML widget that I can explore with. So there's lots of HTML widgets. Some of them are listed on the HTML, website, HTML widgets website. I think there's another, uh, I didn't provide the URL for it. But there's another, another cool package that JJ did is uh, diagraphs, which is to, diagraphs is to time series, what leaflet is to maps. So if you have uh, time series data, you can create these interactive time series very easily, zoom in, get information, so on and so forth. And you can see it's a very small uh, set of code. And all of these packages use the pipe as a sort of a unifying way of making complicated things by joining simple pieces together. Another kind of HTML widget is uh, ggviz that uh, Winston and I worked on. So the goal of ggviz is a little bit more ambitious than these uh, other packages. The goal is not just to make an interactive graphic that solves a specific task, but allow you to easily make an interactive graphic that solves the task that you care about. So the goal is to take the same idea of ggplot2, the idea of there's a grammar of graphics, some way of breaking down complex visualizations into simple independent pieces, and then to extend that to also include interactivity. And the thing I think that I think is coolest about ggviz is it does this, it sort of unifies animation, interactive graphics, streaming data via the idea of uh, reactive programming from Shiny. So ggviz, I think, has a lot of promise, uh, but there's still a lot of bits missing. So I'm going to show you a, what I think is quite a cool demo of it. But I have carefully constructed this demo to not hit any of the parts of ggviz that are not very good right now. So bear that in mind. So I'm going to uh, load a data set from ggplot2, because ggviz doesn't have many built-in data sets yet. And then I'm going to create a visualization. And if you've used ggplot before and you've used dplyr before, it should be really obvious what's going on here. Um, the goal, again, is to express, like ggplot2, what the graphic should look like, how you should map the variables in your data to things that you can perceive, and then ggviz takes care of all the details. So here we're going to start with the mpg data set. We pipe it into ggviz, mapping uh, display, putting displacement on the x-axis, highway miles per gallon on the y-axis. Then we're going to add a layer of points and a layer of smooths. So if we run this, we get a scatter plot with a smoother overlaid on it. Now what's cool about the framework that ggviz is built on is, you know, in ggplot2 you could adjust the wiggliness of this by adjusting the span parameter. In ggviz you can say, well, don't just set it to a constant value, set it to something interactive. Make, it a, make that, map that to a slider. And when I draw this plot, it now adds a slider, and as I drag that slider around, you can see the plot updates. And because the underlying idea is reactivity, from ggviz's perspective, all it sees is a stream of changing values, that means we can do lots of other things. So for example, here I've mapped it to a waggle. And a waggle just is going to smoothly move between point two and one and back again. And so we get an animation of a smooth line. Now this is certainly probably like the least useful graph ever. Uh, not only because you can't control it, but you can't even see what value it is. But this idea, I think, is really important. And so we can take that even further. So I said that this idea of reactivity unifies animation, it unifies interaction, and it also unifies streaming data. So data that is not constant, but changes over time. So I'm going to create a little reactive data frame. Uh, this is just sort of a very 
uh, simple simulation. I'm not going to go through the, the, the code, but you can see it's relatively simple. And if you see what it actually looks like, um, it's just some balls bouncing around. But the way you create the plot is exactly the same. You don't have to say to ggviz, oh, hey, this data is updating. Make sure you update yourself all the time. ggviz just knows how to deal with reactive inputs, and so it just automatically updates the data. Now, I had to do a few extra things here. For example, I needed to pin the scales to a set value. So when you start plotting not just one data set, but many data sets, you have to kind of worry about more things. So for example, if I turn that off, you'll see not only the, does the data change, but the scales also change, uh, which does not make for a graph that's easy to understand. <laughs> So as I said, I think ggviz is uh, really promising. Uh, it's still got a lot of bits work missing. It still needs a lot of work. Uh, my goal, I think, is to, I'm going to try and declare 2016 to be the year of ggviz, and I'll be putting a lot of time into it uh, next year. The goal is eventually, my hope is eventually, that at some point I'm able to say, like ggviz is uniformly better than ggplot2. You can now like stop using ggplot2, start using ggviz. You can do everything you need with it. But currently there's some big holes. You can't do faceting, for example. You can't save the results to a PDF. So there's no way to put these into a paper. You can only use it on websites. So there's lots of things to figure out yet. I'm confident um, that it will be possible. I'm slightly scared because I feel like this is an order of magnitude more complicated than ggplot2 because it's everything that ggplot2 did plus interactivity, which also means if you've got interactivity, it can't take like three seconds to draw a graph. You've got to be able to draw the graph in like a 30th of a second or a 60th of a second. But on the other hand, I think I've got like an order of magnitude better as a programmer since I wrote ggplot2. So hopefully that'll average out and it'll just be a couple of years uh, work. I think the big challenge for these sort of mixed approaches generally is thinking about where should the computation occur. So the more you do an R, the better it is for the R user, right? This is the whole sort of idea of Shiny is that with Shiny, you can do anything you can do in R and now you can make it available in the browser. And also, if you're dealing with a large data set, if you've got a very, very large data set, that data just lives in R. You don't need to send all of the data to the browser. You just send that useful summary or that useful visualization you've come up with. But on the other hand, if you can do more computation in JavaScript, then, well, first of all, the person who's looking at the visualization, their computer does the work rather than your computer, so that saves you money and time. But also because the computation is, is happening locally rather than some other some server running elsewhere, the latency is much, much lower. So that means you can interact with things much more fluidly than if you're having to send messages between the browser and some computer over the internet. So I think probably the answer in the long run it seems like maybe you're going to have to do a mix of computation. You have to do some in the browser, some in R. Of course, then the challenge is how do you keep those in sync so that uh, they don't end up clobbering each other. So I think lots of challenges, but um, the promise is really, really strong. So to finish off, I've told you about three basic approaches. So speaking in tongues, where basically you have an interactive graphic system written in another programming language, typically C or C++ for high performance, and then you connect R to that. The advantage of this is that you're writing all your code in a high performance language, so it's fast. The disadvantage is that it makes it harder to install, and it also makes it harder to recruit new people to work on the project because they need to be able to understand both R and C++. Second approach is to hack the existing graphic systems in R. Uh, this is really pragmatic and useful and makes it very easy for, to take, for you to take your plots now and add small amounts of interactivity, but you are fundamentally limited by the existing systems. And then finally, uh, you can use the, abuse the browser, which really is 
speaking in tongues, but the tongue you are speaking in is JavaScript and JSON, uh, which is great because anyone can see those visualizations. You don't need to install specialized software. You can publish it so that anyone can view these visualizations, uh, but it's it can be slow because you have to send either send data back and forth or you have to think about how can I spread the computation between the server and the client most fairly. So if you'd like to uh, get a copy of the slides and the code I used, uh, it's available on my GitHub and which is linked to from the slightly shorter bit.ly link. Thank you. So all of those HTML widgets do allow you to kind of publish like a static version. But I think, to me, that's just not that interesting because then all you have to do all of the computation in JavaScript. If you want a standalone um, you know, widget or whatever that doesn't have a connection to R, that means obviously you cannot use R code. And to me, that's just a huge limitation because now you have to basically rewrite everything in JavaScript in order to do that, which is great for some audiences. If you're a JavaScript programmer, you know, that's great. You can write a D3 visualization from scratch, do all of the visualization in the browser. But if you're an R programmer, now you have to learn JavaScript as well. So, I, you know, it's, it's possible. I just don't think it's that I interesting to me. So you, you can do that, but you can't get, I mean, you can do that. Any of those HTML widgets, including that 3GS, you can embed static versions of them. So uh, static in the sense that they don't do any, compu any more computation in R, but you can still interact with them in the browser. So you, <clears throat> so you can do that today with those. David? You gave a number of examples where you selected points of the scatter plot uh, using a rectangle. Do any of these packages allow you to either draw a lasso around the points to select or maybe draw a polygon? Uh, yes. <laughs> there, none of them, I'm not, I don't think any of them allow you to do exactly that, but they all have ways of selecting more complicated non-rectangular regions um, using a variety of techniques. So some of them allow you to kind of paint where you can sort of draw and up, you know, you, you color the points as you go. Uh, there's also this idea of selection sequences where you can have multiple rectangular regions and some interactive graphics tools provide you like the full suite of Boolean operations. So you can take a NAND of this rectangle and that rectangle and an exclusive OR with this other rectangle. Um, I don't think any of the ones I showed you do the lasso, but they do have some other, you know, a, a thing that achieve the same goal. Uh, I mean, Google Charts is just another HTML widget library. I, you know, if I, the, it's, it's so the the thing, <laughs> it, the the fundamental problem with it, from my perspective, is it's a typology of graphics. It says, you know, that you have a bar chart, you have a line chart, you have a scatter plot, you have a double axis line chart, and if you want to do one of those plots, then it's great. You can do it. If you want to do something different, you know, you just can't. And so I'm sort of fundamentally more interested in this idea of grammar where you, you, know, you have small components that you can recombine in different ways. Uh, so there, yeah, as well as Google Charts, I mean, I think there's probably like four or five HTML-based, HTML widgets-based packages that bind to similar JavaScript libraries that do basically the same thing, that give you this set of graphics. And, you know, they might be beautiful and elegant, but they're fundamentally limited to what the author of that package created. Okay, okay. Um, Hattie will be around afterwards.